start the recording. Um, and while we're just waiting for a few other folks to join, why don't we just do a quick, um, if you want to pop into the chat, um, your name, your pronouns, um, and your role, so kind of your professional and or parent. I think many of you are both coming to this call for both reasons. Um, so that then everyone will see who's on the call. And I will start with mine. And um, for those of you who are not able to go into the chat, if you're on the phone or something, if you want to unmute yourself, feel free just to um, unmute yourself and tell us who's on, your name, your pronouns, your role, sort of your, you know, if you're calling as parent and or professionally or both. Sorry, my screen is really screwed up. Um, hmm. I'm not sure. It, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm sorry that this screen is a little bit screwed up on my um, on my computer, and I can't figure out how to get the main screen, but I can see it. So, hi. My name's Lay Levy. I'm a parent from Rosa Parks, and I did speak at the BUSD meeting on uh, last Wednesday. Um, I'm an advocate for um, as much in-school learning as possible as we can make, um, you know, in a safe, healthy environment. Um, I really like the idea of outdoor classrooms. Um, one of my main points at the call was trying to figure out from the surveys, who are the teachers who are interested in um, coming back to school and teaching? And who are the parents who are interested in coming back? And, and let's put those groups together and try to figure out um, a pilot program um, of, of getting kids back in, on campus um, in the fall based on all the studies and evidence. Um, so thanks a lot. Cool, thanks so much. Um, Okay, so I'm going to just so to note we're recording this for people who weren't able to join. Um, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, my name is Jenny Mahalan Beers. I am the director of the California Outdoor Engagement Coalition, which is a statewide network around expanding equitable access to nature. Uh, but I am here also as a BUSD parent of two children at Thousand Oaks, and also my husband teaches at Berkeley High School. Um, this initiative is a partnership led by Green Schoolyards America, the Lawrence Hall of Science, um, Sharon Danks, who's a, a BUSD parent, is on the call today. Lawrence Hall of Science, their leadership on this initiative are also BUSD parents, and then 10 Strands and San Mateo County Office of Education. And we're looking specifically at taking this national initiative and thinking about how we can apply it specifically to Berkeley Unified. So the objectives for today is to get an overview from Sharon on the National Outdoor Learning Initiative for COVID, um, think about how this applies to BUSD and to start to get organized on next steps and also a structure for this group. I will say up front that I am looking for one to two more co-leads of this planning team um, to help me sort of keep things organized and structured and moving. Um, it, in order to actually move forward with this, it will probably be a mammoth task with many, many hands on deck. Um, and that's what will be required to move this forward. Um, and I'll need somebody to kind of help me or organize and oversee that. So that is an ask that I will be making at the end of this. Um, so let we did introductions in the chat. Um, I'll give you another chance to do that. Um, a quick land acknowledgement. We'll have an overview from Sharon. Then um, we'll talk specifically about the USD, the status of opening schools, the goals for this planning team, um, kind of actions and breakout topics for this group, as well as the structure for this group. So if you haven't yet already, if you could type into the chat your name, your pronouns, your role here, sort of if it's professional and or parent. And I know if you've joined recently, you can't see the previous chat comments, but I'll be sharing that all out afterwards. Um, I want to also just start with a land acknowledgement just to recognize and honor and thank the Moekma Ohlone tribe, who are the original and continued inhabitants of this land and that we are all living um, on their occupied land. 
Um, I'm going to hand it over to Sharon Danks, who is the CEO of Green School Yards America, Berkeley-based nonprofit, and she really is just a pivotal leader in this national initiative, has been working tirelessly with many partners for about four months now to think about how this can apply nationally, and we are so, so lucky to have her join us. Um, as a Berkeley parent and on this call today to kind of think about how we can apply some of these strategies. So Sharon, I will go ahead. Do you want to show the screen or do you want to just tell me and I'll move the slides? I'll tell you. Thanks. I think it's, it's easier just to keep it as it is. Great. Um, thanks so much for the introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sharon Danks. I run a nonprofit called Green School Yards America. I'm an environmental city planner by training, um, and in normal times, Green School Yards America is focused on helping partner with school districts to think about what they want from their land that they manage as land managers, and helping school districts to, um, to get the most educational benefit, health benefit, and ecological benefit from school ground lands. And so we've shifted in this time to focus on um, COVID-19 response and how, how schools can use outdoor spaces as an asset. And so as, as Jenny was saying, um, we started thinking about this in April and in June held a webinar um, that dialed in on these problem statements um, that we're looking at, which is basically that no school in the country was designed to have kids inside six feet apart. Um, so they just don't have space in their buildings. And uh, our colleagues at the National Council on School Facilities estimates that only about 60% of, of kids would fit in most buildings around the country. Um, so next slide. And uh, we know from our partners at Lawrence Hall of Science and elsewhere have been tracking the educational outcomes that despite best efforts of school districts uh, near and far, um, online learning isn't working for a substantial number of kids. Uh, it wasn't working in the spring. Despite um, incredible efforts put out. It's not school district's fault. It's just kids aren't wired to take five or six hours of learning a day on their, com on their computers. And we, so we see increasing inequalities in who's getting education, learning loss, mental health crisis from kids um, not being at school with one another, and the stress of the pandemic, reduced physical fitness of not being able to go out and do things. Um, and then there, there are impacts like parents not being able to go to work if the kids are not um, at school. And on top of that, we also have an education sector, the non-formal education sector of educators in museums and nature centers and other places who are usually the field trip sites for schools. Um, they are all closed because no one can visit them. And so there's massive job loss happening in that sector. And, and I believe um, Lawrence Hall of Science has a, has a policy brief out about it, which we can share a link to later. And I'm going to try to remember the numbers offhand. It's something like if all those places stay closed through through December, I think only 30% of them expect to exist in, in the coming year if we don't help to um, find a way to save that sector and schools lean on them a lot for education. So we're seeing enormous problems there of, of talented educators who are out of work um, at the same time as our schools potentially need more educators to keep class sizes small. So next, next slide. Um, if we, we know that there are benefits, there's a lot of research out on the benefits of outdoor learning um, that pre predate the pandemic. Um, but we also have, if we use outdoor spaces now, we would have more space to accommodate students so we could spread them out further and get more kids back safely. Um, we'd have more hands-on hands learning opportunities outside. We've got fresh air and less risk of virus transmission, which is becoming increasingly important as we understand more about how this virus spreads. There's mental health benefits that have been documented um, for many years on just having access to views of trees and plants in, in kids' daily environments and teachers' daily environments. Lower stress levels um, improves concentration and test scores too. Um, and and we've, if we can bring everyone back, we can help to reduce inequalities that we're seeing in education. Next slide. So um, out of these, these problem statements we've seen and the, the need to fix them, um, we've created something we're calling the National COVID-19 Outdoor Learning Initiative, which seeks to use outdoor spaces as strategic cost-effective um, tools to increase the capacity on the school sites as we reopen with phys physical distancing measures in place. 
And we're looking at ways that we can use um, both school ground sites and if space isn't available, local park spaces to, to accommodate all classes outside if possible, or a large, as large a percentage of classes as possible outside for fresh air, hands-on learning opportunities, and the mental and physical health benefits that it would afford. Next, please. So the purpose of this initiative is to support school districts around the country um, and schools individually in their efforts to, to take class outside and to do this safely and equitably. Um, and we think that this would maximize the number of kids who can be on site. Next slide. And the overall idea that we're working on is to, to consider um, reframing what, what's, what schools and districts are thinking about as plan A. So a lot of times now what we have, we're, we see mostly that online learning is plan A. It's the first thing people are turning to with hybrid learning as a, sometimes also a plan A. Um, but what if outside was plan A? What if we thought about taking every single class and finding a place for them to sit outside in as whole classes or as half classes um, around their grounds and in parks? And then we only went inside or online as plan B when the outdoor spaces were unsuitable due to weather or other problems. Um, and so we're proceeding on that idea and trying to help schools and districts make plans to to do that um, using low cost temporary materials to set up outdoor classroom spaces um, on their site. This is not big complicated landscape architecture. This is more landscape triage, really. You know, how do we, how do, we do it fast and quickly and comfortably at a large scale? And, and do so planning for the weather, for, for it being too hot or too rainy, too snowy or too windy. And also thinking about equity and making sure that every child has enough clothing to be outside and be equally dry and warm or cool as the case may be. Next. And we're trying also not to overthink this idea. It does not have to be to, you know, extremely complicated. These pictures are from 100 years ago during the tuberculosis and Spanish flu epidemics when schools all over the world took their classes outside by just opening their doors and moving their furniture out. So as simply as we can think, you know, this is a way, it's a time-tested way to have school open during a pandemic to be outside where the air is fresh. Next slide. So to think about this topic and to break it down into pieces, um, we, are, we have 10 working groups engaged, the ones around the outside that are, are writing, each group is writing a series of two pagers that are kind of the frequently asked questions of how do you do X, Y, Z, so that we can, by the end of the summer, help to answer questions for school districts that want to come, come to us and say, great, we wanna have outdoor learning. And the next question is, how do we have outdoor learning? And so these, these groups are each producing content related to the topic that's, that's written there um, to together create a kind of online manual um, for this, this topic. And we have some of it online now and we'll have pieces, more pieces of it added between now and the end of the summer. And then working group 11 um, is a community practice of early adopters or those schools and districts that, that don't wanna wait for the end of the summer to get started in their thinking and who wanna hear what other schools and districts are thinking about as they start their initial planning without the manual um, that's being written. And so I'm happy to say that Berkeley is participating in that early adopter group, which is fabulous. Next slide. Um, and so this is a little bit about that group. It, um, yeah, we've got about 25 different cities participating. There's about 200 people that come and go through the, through the weekly meetings. We've had 100 people at each meeting for the last couple of weeks, and we invite you to join us and we can share a link that later. Each, each group is bringing say two to ten people and they're at all different levels of the planning spectrum with the, with the common theme of just interested in this idea and want to know how it can be explored and developed. Next please. Um, a couple of documents we show them and we turn to ourselves are um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a guide for school um, <clears throat> for reopening schools and they are uh, looking at outdoor spaces and include them in every in recommendations at every age group. Um, they say utilize outdoor spaces when possible. And so we are consistent with their recommendations. Next slide. And then this week, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine um, published their document called Reopening K-12 Schools During the COVID-19 Pandemic. And they also include text throughout that refers to using outdoor classrooms when possible as well. So, it's being recommended um, in those places at the national level too. Next. 
And the, the first one is linked on our website. The second one I have, it's so new, I haven't updated it yet. Um, and so our website looks like this. We have um, the, the products that the working groups are going to be f filling these, these areas uh, of the website more completely, but you'll see that there are some resources already posted and there is a link to the working group page if you'd like to participate in any of the discussions. Um, that's it, next please. This is an example of what the outdoor infrastructure page looks like. It's one of the more de well-developed pages. We have materials schools can download, and I'll, I'll step through some of these, so next please. Starting with a, a seating chart, um, we thought about how, how big does an outdoor classroom space have to be if assuming classes are split in half and have somewhere between um, 10 and 15 kids in a grouping, and you also have to be seated, seated far enough apart to be six feet apart, but yet close enough together so a teacher can be heard across the circle and you lose a teacher's voice after about 20, 25 feet. So I'm a little, I think the 29 foot diameter is maybe a little big on the bottom left, but the rest should be easy enough to hear a teacher in most circumstances. So that the circles are generally 25, 26 feet in diameter and the squares are 18 inches square. So we use that model, next slide please, and started to work through examples. And so this is, we have three on our website. Two of them are from California. This one is from Virginia, um, but it's got a bit more detail. So I picked this one to show you. Um, so we start by looking at an individual site and um, thinking about how many classes it has. In this case, 39 classes, 828 kids. And we're, and this is a school that gets snow, some snow in the winter. It gets rain year round, um, twice our annual rainfall. Um, and they have four very distinct seasons. They're in the suburbs on about 13 acres. Next, please. And so the first thing that schools do are you walk around and look at what you already have and what kinds of things, like, do you have outdoor seating already? And it could be as simple as stumps in a clearing or picnic tables, or do you have areas that are wide and open and flat that could be good, easily converted, cheaply converted outdoor classroom spaces? Next. And then um, you map those areas. And here you see the little round blue circles and squares match the diagram I was showing you um, a minute ago. And this is an assessment of where is the low cost, where are the low cost places on this schoolyard where they already have easy outdoor seating existing or easily added. And so with very little additional funding, they could add, they could have 14 outdoor seating areas. Um, to seat half a class. And they have 39 classes, so that's about 25% of their enrolled capacity. Um, and um, we would also add a couple of tool sheds to keep teacher supplies and things, but this, this would work when the weather was nice, when it wasn't raining or boiling hot, because it without shade structures. Next, please. And then we thought about, well, what if they added shade structures, had a moderate investment, and they put in shade structures for every outdoor classroom and added a lot more benches on many more places that were flat and open, um, and while still leaving the PE area and recess spaces open. And so this one has um, 32 seating areas for the 39 classes, doesn't quite meet everybody's need, but has, has a fair sense of where they would go. And then the next slide. Um, and in this scenario, the new ones have been added on the left in the forest that requires the addition of a fence to divide the school campus from the road and, and some clearing of the forest to make those. So this is a more major investment plan, but it could seat 50% of the school population outside in 39 outdoor classrooms, which would allow 39 classes to also meet in their regular room inside so they could have 100% return if they so desired, or they could have 50% return with everybody sitting outside uh, in most weather. Next slide. And then we went through, so this is a map of those first, second, and third choice areas, low cost, moderate cost, and higher cost to install them um, all on the map at the same time. Next slide. And then we went through and looked at, made an Excel chart of all 39 classes and kind of quantified what is their ground surface like, what are their shade needs, so we could look more specifically to see who might need picnic benches, which ones might need logs, you know, what, what would you put in each spot? This is it an assessment step that would dial in more specifically what they need. And then next slide. And then we have a cost estimate tool on our website that you can download that has frameworks for the like approximate costs for different types of infrastructure. And it all has ranges, next slide, depending on, um, it just shows you the ballpark cost. 
And the idea is schools can put their own unit cost into this chart once they pick something and have a sense of where it fits in the ballpark to do a cost estimate for the number of classes with the type of materials they want. And it's all include seating and shelter and hygiene and all different categories. Um, and also mobile outdoor classroom spaces, which we'll get into in a second. Next slide. So shelter um, is crucially important. And here we have at the top of the page there um, a, a shot, a recent shot from Gulliston Education, Yalda Modaber's school. She's on the call today, um, which is amazing and up and running. Um, shelter is, is really, oh, the bottom one too on the right is also. Uh, shelter is key and it lets you stay out, like it lets you extend the shoulder season longer so that you can go out not just when it's a perfect temperature, but when it's a little hot, a little cold, a little rainy. Um, and it extends plan A to stay as the primary option for a longer period of time. Um, and so there's so many options and we are in the midst of doing some research with the Division of State Architect and, and California's um, Facilities Department for the State uh, Education, um, uh, State Department of Education, and we'll find out more specifics about if they have any flexibility during COVID for their structure installations. But shelter is key, and, and we hope that all schools will be able to provide some rain and shade structures in the future. Next slide. Um, and, but not everyone might build infrastructure. There are ways to have classes when you're not actually building anything either. And this would work well if you're taking a class to a park or if you have a green space that you don't want to modify at a school. Next slide. So we made a, started to make lists of what would students need to have in a backpack to go with to go to the park for the day and it might be a seat cushion and a sun hat and sun you know sunblock and weather appropriate clothing and notebooks and hand sanitizer and things along those lines and this is included on our cost estimate chart next slide and similarly what might teachers need if they wanted to have a wagon of supplies to take with them to the neighborhood park and so um, we have those those written out in the cost estimate chart too next and then in addition, there's different staffing models to consider. Is it the how is the classroom teacher being in two places at once if, if the class is divided in half? Um, next slide. And their working groups four and five are working on this question. And here's an example from one principal's school who was thinking this through in the Bay Area at a pre-K through five school. Um, she has a low, low enrollment in her school, 13 classes, 250 students. Um, and there she's very focused on getting 100% of the kids back five days a week because her kids experience massive learning loss um, And she wants to plan for them to have 100% of the space inside and 100% outside So she divided in half Next slide. She's got enough space both in her building and on the grounds And so in this model um, this particular school would would have four days of normal curriculum with a and b days um, with kids and maybe well, four days of, of all the kids, all the classes coming back, and the fifth day would be an enrichment wheel day taught by outside partners so the teachers could have planning time. And her plan is to have, they have uh, teaching assistants, paraprofessionals in every class almost, so they would split their classes in half and have the para take one half of the class while the other teacher taught the other, and they would coordinate on the curriculum. Um, and they have existing partners at the, the YMCA and um, another organization that would that normally do their aftercare and so they're looking into extending that relationship to take care of class on the Fridays so that they could have an enrichment wheel as well and kind of blend seamlessly into their before and after school programs. Um, yeah, and so that's just how one school is thinking about solving this problem, but there we're also hoping that we can plug in educators from the non formal institutions that are in danger of going out of business if we can find a way to to build partnerships between districts and those organizations. Next slide. Sharon, there was a question as to whether or not that example is a private or public school. Um, this one is a public school in a very low income area of a, a local city. And they're not quite done with their planning, but they'll go, they'll, they'll be able to be named later, but they're, they're still in the progress and so they're not ready to advertise it yet. But it's an active conversation with the principal at a, at a public school. Yeah. Thanks. That's a very fast overview of what we've been done, but you can, what we have been doing, but you can see that there's a lot of thought going into it. We have about 300 volunteers working in 10 different committees on producing information together to share and it will be populating onto the website. And the next couple pieces are gonna be some videos we just shot recently looking at Golestan School <laughs> on Friday and some looking at, you know, putting up case study models of, of what schools are doing.
Awesome. Thanks, Sharon. Um, before we move into the next section, just talking specifically about Berkeley Unified and how we could apply this here, um, are there any questions for Sharon? Feel free to unmute yourself or type them into the chat. Hi, Sharon. My name is Hannah Stone, and I'm a parent from Berkeley Unified. And my question is, are there teachers engaged with this planning process? And the reason I ask is I feel like um, for anything to really get off the ground, especially in BUSD, the teachers need to be on board. And I'm just curious of teacher feedback. Yeah, I mean, there are there are teachers involved. Um, the, the group for the early adopters cohort has the, the districts bring teams with them of whoever they'd like and often their district staff principals and some teachers and some parent advocate and advocate advocacy groups a mixture i think from what i've been hearing teachers are, seem more comfortable being outside in the fresh air than inside um, it hasn't been systematically studied but it like for that with that particular question but that's my kind of anecdotal um understanding of what i'm seeing and i i think we aren't asking the question specifically enough to get that answer in a in a um, measured way, but I would love to see that. But yes, teachers are involved and um, in our key as are our principals. And I know we have at least one teacher on the call. If you want to jump in, Carrie, and answer that question. And also, I'm in communication with Matt Meyer, who's the the president of the BFT Teachers Union. He and I are going to talk on Friday. He hasn't been able to join this call, but as well as the um, the head of the Berkeley, the union for the Berkeley Classified Employees, as well, um, who are all of our you know paraprofessionals and support staff in the schools. Carrie, did you want to say anything? Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and jump in. I think, I mean, teachers are under having tremendous anxiety right now about the fall. Uh, of course, we want to be back in the classroom with the students. And uh, for me, it was really hopeful to hear that, you know, there's some movement towards, well, what can we do that could work? Because just we know that the online learning was really problematic. We know that going back in the classroom is problematic. So I was definitely interested to think, try to think creatively um, along with Jenny and the rest of you about, well, what can we do to make this work for parents, teachers, most of all the students? Um, and just from the logistical standpoint, I'm just having a really hard time just visualizing. I guess maybe if we see the video, that would give more information. But for example, my site, Sylvia Mendez, I mean, we have an amazing garden there where a class could definitely be, but to try to imagine all of us kind of scattered around the playground with our classes, I think that teachers are really reluctant to, um, to, to or it's just hard to imagine such a drastic change because we're so used to our classroom space or we have our whiteboard and our document camera and our stations. and obviously we're going to have to let go, go of all of that if we can't go back into the classroom but i think it will be more it'll be helpful to hear more um about what it would look like logistically for it to work but i think teachers are very reluctant just in terms of how will the kids maintain focus if we're out there especially if there's multiple classes trying to share a playground space and i i mean i haven't thought about it a lot, but it is interesting to think about what would be those options to, I mean, when you mentioned like me pulling a wagon with a whiteboard to like a local park or something, then that to me is, um, sounds like a lot different from what I'm used to. I would be open to it. I love the outdoors. I'm really passionate about outdoor ed. So, but I think of all the, and I don't want to speak for all the teachers by any means, but I think that there's a lot of questions that teachers have about how this would work. Thanks, Carrie. Um, so there's a question here. Um, sorry, I've lost it. Um, is daycare integrated for teachers' children into any of these models? And Yalda responded in the chat, but Sharon, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, <clears throat> we haven't specifically looked at daycare for the teachers um, as part of it, but we're I guess we're trying to get the whole system up and into back into school. So hopefully that would cover the teachers' children too. Uh, and the before and after school programs being able to re-engage outside as well would hopefully help with that as well. Um, 
yeah, I did hear one principal who was planning to bring her own kids back to the school she was managing because they were going to be open. So I don't know if that's going to shift at all for, for teachers. I guess it depends the age of the kid. But we haven't specifically dialed in on that question. It's a good question. Great. Um, and Yalda mentioned in the chat that they're looking into setting up a dedicated pod for staff whose elementary age kids didn't go to the school and that in that pod they get distance learning support and some hands on activities. Um, Sandy asked about Newsom's new order for and if it allows for outdoor programs or would BUSD have to wait until Alameda was off the watch list. Um, now I'll talk about that, but my understanding is, is that we would have to wait until Alameda County is off the watch list for 14 days and that applies to outdoor learning at schools as well. Is that your understanding as well, Sharon? Yes, but I haven't researched it, so I'm not yeah. sure. Great. Um, okay, great. Thank you so much. So. Um, so yeah, so what, let's talk specifically about Berkeley Unified now. So as we know, um, first day of school is August 17th. The school board has voted that the soonest that that would go through August, and it'll be distance learning, and that the soonest that it could be open up to distance learning is after October 9th, which, or to in-person learning, sorry, is after October 9th. So that means October 12th would be the earliest start date for outside learning, in-person learning at the district. Um, and just re we referred to Governor Newsom's order that any county that has not been on the watch list for 14 days is allowed to open schools. We've been on the watch list since July 14th, expected to remain there for a few weeks. There's a link here um, if you want to see about us being on the watch list. And as we said, that we don't believe that outdoor learning is exempt from these orders. Um, although one question I have is why then are camps exempt from the orders? So if anyone wants to research that. Rita, to share that information. Um, so goals for this kind of planning team is really to come up with concrete, creative, and equitable ways of using the outdoors to support BUSD to open when it's deemed safe to do so. So there are a few points that I want to make. Um, one is that equity has to be at the center of our approach, that if the solutions that we're proposing are going to work for the most vulnerable students and families and teachers and staff of our district, then they'll most likely work for those with more privilege. So we have to keep that at the center of what we're focusing on. Um, we also need to work collaboratively with key stakeholders. So I'm really glad Hannah brought up the point about teachers. So this is really about a collaborative effort with district leaders, with school board members, as well as school board candidates. Um, there are two uh, school board seats that are up for re-election in November, and neither of them, Beatrice and Judy Appel, they're not running for re-election. So there are two empty seats in November and three candidates currently. Um, unions, so Berkeley Federation of Teachers and the Berkeley Council of Classified Employees, the BUSD Office of Family Engagement and Equity, the Berkeley Public Schools Fund, the PTAs and Families, the Mayor and City Council and City and Regional Parks, particularly when we think strategically about how to utilize streets and parks to um, provide outdoor learning. I'd love you to go ahead and type into the chat if there's any other group. So thank you. Sandy wrote in the Black Parent Advisory Committee. Um, any other groups that you feel like we definitely need to make sure that we're integrating into this? Any individuals or, or groups, please use the chat so that we can make sure that we can include those. Um, another quick point is that this might not happen soon. It might not happen nearly as soon as any of us would like, but the using the outdoors will increase the chances that we'll be able to open up sooner and safer. And we want to be ready. If the district comes to us and they say, okay, we actually can open up in October, we need to be ready with plans for how to actually do that. And when I say us, I know that there are people in the district here on this call, right? And we want to know how we can best support you um, to figure out like what this would actually look like. Um, and I also want to be clear that this is not a place to debate. For those of you who are on the um, school board meeting on Wednesday night, I personally felt pretty sad. It felt very much like families were really advocating for schools to open and teachers were saying not. I really want this to be a collaborative process where people are working together and thinking about how to do this safely for everyone in our community. Um, so some potential action items that this group could, could take on. Okay, so one is, we you know, we talked about Golestin School in El Cerrito, Yalda, the director's on the call, she's a BUSD parent. 
um, thinking about, uh, we've found three dates where we want to schedule some site visits for key decision makers. Unfortunately, those have to be pretty limited in number because of COVID restrictions. So there can only be 10 people total at each visit. But we're working on thinking about who are the key people that have to be on that visit, like the head of um, facilities, Jesser Thompson, who's on this call, who's the head of the cooking and gardening program, is a, is a big supporter and actively involved in this initiative, um, and other key folks. Um, thinking about contact lists for individuals and groups that we want to make sure are included in this effort and aware of this effort. So like principals and PTA presidents. Um, looking at school specific assessments. So Sharon shared a lot of really great information about how you kind of evaluate what schools already have. So talking, we'll start specifically with the, with the facilities directors and then think about, okay, what are the, what information do we already know? So what schools already have shade? What schools are close to a park? What schools have enough space for outdoor learning and how much could they fit there? Um, and really starting to ask some of those questions. With that in mind, it might mean that we have to start with a pilot site. So it might say, and that would ideally be to design procedures that could be applied district wide. And it might be that we find one principal and one teacher and 10 families and one custodian who say, yes, we're willing to try this out on October 12th. And we have the school board's approval and, and then we use that to learn from it. Um, we need to make sure that we're monitoring local public health guidance on congregating safely outdoors. And so that includes things like, my understanding from the school board meeting is that, you know, Berkeley High School sports are currently meeting right now and practicing. And I'm, I think that I would really love to learn more about that guidance and why that's allowed. Um, and, you know, meeting in outdoor classrooms currently is not. And really like do this in a collaborative, um, coordinated effort. So um, another one is just starting to think about where are there parks and streets that could be used for outdoor classrooms um, when school grounds aren't an option. School grounds would be number one, but if that's not an option, where are there some that we could some parks and streets that we could use? And then the last one is around budget and fundraising for supplies and really keeping the uh, focus on thinking about equity with this as well. But Sharon went over a lot of the supplies and shared um, a link to some of the costs and thinking about how we could support the district with paying for some of this. So my thought on the structure for this group is that I would find one to two more people who would help to co-lead this with me. Um, I imagine that we would meet weekly. Yay, I see a hand that makes me so happy um, that we would that we would coordinate with the district, that we would manage contact lists, calendar invites, decide on kind of actions and breakout groups, meeting agendas, that we would not be in charge of doing the work, but helping to really coordinate and facilitate. Then whoever is interested in being involved, whether it's district staff or parents or community members, would form into smaller teams based on different tasks that most interest you. You know, if you say, hey, I'm a parent at this school, I can take on a certain assessment at this particular school site, for example. And that's where Sharon and all of her work comes so helpful because we can provide that guidance and those tools for you to do that. Um, for the most part, some of it we're going to be figuring this out as we as we go along. Um, and then I imagine some sort of regular working group call with this whole group and whoever, or planning team call with this group and whoever, you know, the members of the smaller teams, whoever wants to come, they can report out what they're learning, ask questions, engage. Um, it would be great to have ongoing communication. So some of you might be aware of this group, East Bay Education Bubbles. It's been started by some parents at Sylvia Mendez. Um, the link is in here. They have created up a Slack. Um, a Slack network, and there's a bunch of different channels in there. They created a channel specifically for this group, so like a channel specifically on outdoor learning that we can use. I'm just learning Slack. It's not my favorite. It's a little bit of a learning curve, but it is actually a really great way to organize and share resources and communication rather than not having a million and one emails. Um, they have a survey that if you want to receive their emails, you can receive it. So the, sort of the focus of their group is around how do you, help, given distance learning, how do you support families with kind of creating bubbles or pods with other families and um, to support one another with, with, and so they have a survey and if you sign up for the survey, you'll give them the contact information. There's no commitment at all, um, but it just means you'll receive their emails. 
And they have Tuesday night calls, 8 to 9.30 every Tuesday night. And there's a, a Zoom link there and a password. Um, and I imagine, so, you know, their, their purpose is slightly different, right? Like they're organizing and supporting families to kind of how do we make distance learning the best that it can be. And sort of the purpose of this group is, okay, how do we get the district to think about and support the district with utilizing the outdoors? And I imagine that the timeline for this, for this planning team would basically be until schools reopen, but then also through that initial process to help schools to continue to remain open after that. Um, are there any questions right now on sort of like both these action items that I've talked about for the group, as well as the, the structure for this group? And feel free to type it into the chat or unmute yourself and talk. Hi, I have a question. Yeah, I'm Abby. I'm a, actually an incoming Sylvia Mendez parent. Um, I think it's it's this is like a great focus on the outdoor on the outdoor learning. But one of the things that I've heard from the district is they also want to do the sort of the childcare component with these ed camps that they're talking about. And I and that seems like an avenue that we might be able to approach sooner. Like it, it seems like they're trying to put something together in conjunction with maybe the city and the parks. And I wonder if we're also thinking about that that we could support outdoor. Um, you know, their, their efforts to do outdoor childcare, which I think they would be able to do sooner. I mean, it seems like such a shame that we might be able to launch this right as it's going to start raining. And, uh, you know, like, like maybe there's something that we can do in conjunction with their, their ed camp idea. Um, I wonder if that's part of the, the thought process also. Yeah, raining and also fire season. We have to be aware of that as well. Um, Jezra, I don't know. Can you hear I, my... I'm wondering if you were able to answer that question about ed camps. Did you hear that question? Yeah, I did. Um, and it's, it's a great question. And Michelle and I are in that planning group. And we still don't have any updates on what's happening with ed camp with the latest and greatest news of how we can welcome students back on a campus safely. Um, I, I know that, you know, whatever we are discussing here, whatever we're learning in our working groups um, that Sharon's facilitating, I'm taking back and hopefully able to inform how we welcome students onto campus. That's all I can say on, on ed camp um, in terms of if it's happening or if it's not happening. We also want to make sure that it's going to be serving those students that need it the most, right? And serving our teachers and staff that need it in order to come to, um, to work and, and teach our kids. So these are all considerations right now. Thanks. Any other questions? I guess I'm um, curious. Sorry. I, yeah, I, I, the Zoom screen is is a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, I can't figure it out. Sorry. Okay. Um, so my question, I guess, is is you know what Jenny had mentioned before is we're all at camps right now. The kids are all playing right now, and yet there's a sense that they can't be together in a month. So I'm just, I'm just wondering, like, in terms of just acknowledging that very basic truth that a lot of kids are at camp right now. I understand those are smaller groups, but it's like, I just, I just find that there's a disconnect there that I don't, um, I don't really understand why that's happening, um, because again. People are figuring it out. Um, you know, I've right today. There's there are people who are starting to create pods within our classes, and it's like they're not including everybody in the class. And I think that's an issue. That's an equitable. You know, that's an equity issue. That's what we're talking about right here. So I just think the idea that no, you know, kids aren't getting together right now. I, I think we need to start being realistic to that. And and based on that truth how do we start moving in the next month and i get like we're all um at the mercy of the numbers but we all have to also be honest with what is going on camps are open today uh preschools are open today and the kids are thriving who are in them yeah so i think what you know one of the breakout teams could actually explore that a little bit you know that could be one of the tasks that the team does is does a little research and guide it and ask the questions and where do those rules come from and how do we decide? Any other thoughts and questions?
Does anyone know if these ed camps are exempt or if they qualify for the waiver? So my understanding um, is that these camps qualify under the category for Alameda County under child care or youth extracurricular activity. And as long as the unit is 12 children or youth or less, and it's maintained in a stable group for a period of time, they qualify. So it's under, it qualifies its youth unit. Hmm. But what I don't, what I don't know is I know that there are private schools, for example, who are planning to open in Alameda County. And I don't know, you know, maybe Newsom's um, most recent guidance as of last week has changed that. I'm not really sure. But I was curious, how do those schools open? Yeah, Yalda, I want you to answer that, but Hannah, do you have a link you could share that you were just reading to us that you could maybe stick in the chat or email me and I can um, find it. Someone, I'm pretty sure I can find, I'll find it, Jenny, and send okay. it to you. Cool. I have it because my daughter's soccer was planning to start um, Got practicing it. and it falls under that category. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, Yalda, do you want to answer that question about private schools? Yeah, actually the call I was in that I had to leave early to come in here was a weekly head of schools group um, with schools from Alameda and Contra Costa County. They're actually, nobody, there's no clarity. We've all called our local, our, our counties for more information on the waiver and nobody's able to give anyone any information because they just a first for everyone. Um, there's no one that, there's no point person as far as we can tell, and it looks like none of these rules have been written yet. That's why I was um, surprised about this ed camp clause. Um, the schools in Alameda County that I was just on a call with, none of them are sure that they're going to be able to open, but half of them were interested in uh, pursuing the exemption, and half of them weren't, because they just don't have the, the confidence in their protocols and their, their space to be able to, to um, fulfill the requirements. We do, we exceed it. We're, it's, we're just, we're very fortunate to have this much space and outdoor space. Um, and that's why we wanna get the waiver so that we can set up a model and then bring the district and other districts through to see how it can work in real life. And then those districts can scale it up. We're small, we're nimble, easy for us. Thanks. Uh, Susan, did you want to say something? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Susie. <laughs> and um, it's my understanding that for now, the order does apply um, to private schools as well, to independent schools as well. Um, that seems to be, from what I'm hearing from the counties, the general interpretation that both, the general, sorry, the general interpretation is that it applies to all schools, both independent and public. And that wasn't true until this order. And that's been kind of the problem with all the orders is just when everybody interprets one, there's new guidance and um, the governor's orders are different than your local um, public health officer's orders. And it can be very aggravating if you start trying to read the orders together because they just don't make sense. So. Mm. Thank you. Um, so we have a few more minutes. Any other questions, comments? Well, you know, to Yalda's point, I think, you know, and to Denny's point, we have to be ready. We have to be ready for a plan because there has been really no leadership in any of this. And the people who are open to, you know, volunteering their time and, 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 and you know, their effort to a pilot program, I think could really be, um, you know, the example that we all need because the messaging has been all over the place. Um, it seems like there nobody's sure of anything, but one thing I'm sure of is that the kids who've been at camp since June 15th are all thriving because they're all playing together and there is some semblance of normalcy for them. And I think if we think about 
the, you know, what this has done to all of our communities, we need to start building it back in a safe way. So I think I'm really encouraged by, you know, everybody being on this call and, and you know, Sharon's, um, you know, I, I love the pictures from the Spanish flu of the classrooms. Had not seen that, wow, you know, it's like, the outdoor classrooms back in 1918. Okay, so they figured it out back then. We can figure it out now. So um, thanks for that. Can I, can I respond to that really briefly? I'm sorry. I, I do want to give credit where it's due. I don't believe that there hasn't been any leadership. I just think this is, I mean, just for me, running a tiny, tiny little school has been the most overwhelming experience of my life. And I've worked really hard my whole life. And then every time I would get an, an email from the superintendent, I would just really feel so much empathy because to have to address so many different people's needs, and they're all valid needs, and at that scale is enormous. And I, mm -hmm. I actually would say that considering all the challenges and all the different directions in which they're all getting pulled, they've done a really great job. Our kids haven't necessarily benefited from that yet, but I would say that, um, it's there are a lot of different people involved in this process that are actually um, impacting our leadership's ability to, to do what's best for our kids. Can I ask a question or interject a bit? Jenny? Yeah, please, sure. Jamila. Hi. 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 Um, so I just feel like two pieces of logistical information would be so helpful in organizing um, small groups around BUSD. One is class cohort lists, something that we've discussed extensively in the spring. If that information could become available sooner rather than later, then families could organize within their cohorts to create smaller groups that could work together um, to support academic learning and socializing and all of their needs. If we have to go beyond cohort groups, it's gonna be nearly impossible to support academics within a cohort, like a mini pod. Um, so just an ask to the district and to school site leadership to please confirm and share that information as soon as possible. And the second ask is around schedule. If BUSD has um, regular Zoom meetings that are required of all students, it would be really, really helpful to know what that timing looks like. So again, we can organize around it. Thank you. Cool, thanks Jamila. I feel like the folks on this call are not the ones who are gonna be able to answer those two questions. Um, <clears throat> I feel like that's gonna be like a school board superintendent principal group. And I think the East Bay bubble group is a really good group to sort of work with. I know you're part of that in terms of get, you know advocating to get that information, but I, I that will be helpful for everyone to know. Um, I will share to this last slide, which a list of relevant articles. I know there have been a bunch of other articles shared in the chat that I'll be sure to send around as well. But um, one of them is was actually just from today from the San Francisco Chronicle from a BUSD parent on um, the impacts of keeping schools closed in Berkeley specifically. And then there have been a ton of articles and, and Sharon's doing an amazing job of keeping her website, her the media library updated on her website and that's linked there as well. So I think in, in closing, in terms of next steps, what I'm looking for is to have one or two or three of you email me um, or type in the chat and let me know that you'd be interested in co-facilitating this group with me. Then we will set up a call um, and figure out exactly the structure for moving forward in terms of setting up a Slack channel, in terms of setting up a regular call that everyone is invited to, and then dividing up into break in, breakout groups and action items. So yay, I just got someone privately text message me. I'm very happy. So awesome. Um, message me, text me, and then or uh, message me or email me, and then we will um, be in touch. And then so for those of you who are not interested in co-facilitating, as long as your name is on that contact list, um, then you will receive any communication about this. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there it was. <laughs> God, really.
my messages. Thank you, Sage. I saw your message. I'm so excited. Okay. Cool. I'll be in touch. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Maybe we can schedule a time to talk. Um, I'm going to hold on. Let me just stop.